on the NAM YouTube station. So, um, okay. Uh, Terry, I want to thank you for being here with us today to answer some of the most difficult questions a nonprofit government is facing us. Uh, would you tell us a little bit more about yourself and why you were compelled to answer my request to be here today? Well, it was the big bucks. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I hope these questions aren't that difficult. Uh, I'm looking at the screen and seeing a picture of me and my wife, and you're probably wondering why she's in the picture. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Before I began my foray into the world of a nonprofit board, I attended four nonprofit board meetings uh, in my capacity as secretary and general counsel for several public companies, uh, where I learned how boards function and I learned better uh, what the purpose of a board is in the life of an organization. My first experience as a nonprofit board uh, member was at the Nebraska Arts Council, where I ended up serving as chair for four or five years, as I remember. Fortunately, I was able to take my experience from uh, the, the uh, for-profit world uh, in, uh, in stepping into that position. Uh, for example, I learned how to, how to call a meeting to order. Uh, you take a spoon and you ding it on the side of a glass and it gets everybody's attention. Those little critical uh, matters uh, sound funny, but it's pretty scary to be suddenly be a board, member, board chair and have to conduct a meeting. Uh, over time, I've served on a number of boards in Omaha, Lincoln, regionally, and I'm now serving on a board in New York State. Uh, during all the years I've served on boards, there was a revolution taking place in the, uh, regarding governance practices in nonprofit organizations. These are brought about by a series of uh, uh, debacles at Enron, uh, WorldCom, and even nonprofits, large nonprofits such as United Way. The problem was in those organizations was a failure by boards to provide adequate oversight. Uh, so much of the change was driven by response to those this situation by the United States Congress and by the Internal Revenue Service. And a great deal of focus was put on what best practices would be for governance in nonprofit boards. And, uh, and I, I just began studying those uh, procedures, practices, and, and beginning to think about documentation that would work in board settings. When I went on many boards, I discovered that many of the board members, my colleagues, felt disenfranchised or uninformed. Uh, they weren't engaged. In fact, they were really bored. They felt like their talents, their skills, their ability, their experience, their expertise, their strategic thinking capabilities just weren't being used. So, uh, I set out to implement policies and procedures in those organizations to comply with the laws, the regulations, and the best practices that were being uh, uh, discussed around the country. And then, probably more difficult, seeing that those practices, policies, and procedures were put into action. So today, uh, what we're going to look at is some of the issues that may arise in the life of a, of, an or, of a nonprofit organization and confront the board, look at how we deal with those questions in the short term, but also what long-term solutions can be put in place using governance, best governance practices in order to prevent those problems from coming up. In the Thank you, Terry. Uh, now are you ready to dive into some scenarios? Well, I just, before we do that, I just want to say that you know, one size doesn't fit all in this, in this area. So uh, it takes time to draft, discuss, and implement policies. You need a commitment on the part of board members to make this work. You particularly need the support, of, or at least the leadership, by a key board member, preferably the chairman person, and the buy-in by the executive director. So it's a, there's a fundamental question about how, how understanding the importance of boards, the value of a good, strong board by everybody, not just the board, but also the executive director. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Well, let's, 
let's dive in. I'm so glad you're here because uh, I certainly cannot work through these scenarios by myself. So the first scenario is uh, the organization's fiscal year is coming to an end. Surprise, income is below expenses. What can we do right now? Well, we can uh, we can um, throw our hands up in despair. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly uh, no one on a board wants to be surprised, but if these situations come up, you you have a limited number of, of solutions. Uh, the first one is well, cut costs. But if the problem arises at the end of the year, there's no way you can cut sufficiently to solve the problem. Um, you can draw on reserves if you have been fortunate enough to set aside some money for operating costs reserve in case you need the reserves. Um, you can draw on endowments, which is a bad idea, but some endowments have some flexibility in them to allow you to go after the principal or borrow against them. Uh, but it's a it's a really dreadful uh, way to go because uh, it's, it's often the case that you draw down your endowment but you never replenish it. And that has a rippling effect that really uh, deters donors from giving you any money for endowments because they want to see it held in perpetuity and that the income is used for the organization, not the principal. Uh, you might also um, to have a relationship with the bank in which you could uh, have established a line of credit. It helps to have the line of credit in place before you have the emergency. But if you have a line of credit, if you have a, a, a situation like that, you can draw on it, uh, assuming you're able to replenish it in the next, in the next cycle. Um, the, the, well, I mean, you, you, may, you may have a question, I think. Yeah, well, I guess I'm wondering, can we set up a line of credit uh, in the middle of this emergency or is this something that we need to establish in advance? Well, bankers don't like surprises any more than boards do. I think you should have a relationship with the bank through your checking accounts and other, other accounts. And if you have investments, you may work through the bank's trust department manage your investment. And it's the logical thing is to work with that same bank to see if you need a, a line of credit. Oftentimes, cash flow is sporadic. You have times when you have money and you're able to pay your bills, and then you have those moments when the cash doesn't come in. This is particularly true with organizations that have a season, like a playhouse or a, a symphony or a, a, um, an opera, for example. Money comes in when tickets are sold, and then off-season, off there's no income coming in from ticket sales, and so there's often a drop in, in uh, income. In order to bridge that gap, lines of credit can be very helpful. But it requires discipline because you have to, main, you have to draw those, you have to replenish those lines or, or pay them down so that they, uh, you aren't carrying it a long time. The problem with debt is that if you incur it and you don't take care of it right away, it becomes a drag over the period of time you increase, you, you increasingly go to your line of credit or you increasingly go to your endowment. And uh, for com it comes, at the end of the day, it's, a, it's a, uh, a real big problem for you. So there, you would suggest that there are only particular situations in which a line of credit is, a, is an appropriate way to go. Well, it's a handy device for uh, a cash flow situation where you have periodic uh, shortfalls of income that you know you're going to have and you can plan for it by using a line of credit. Now, uh, the, other, the, other, the other solution, which is the worst possible solution, is that you, you have a meeting of your board and the chairman looks around the room and says, well, we're all going to have to kick in to make this work. <laughs> Uh, that has some, or we've got to go out to our donors and ask them for more money. Uh, that's, those are bad, really bad situations because you demoralize your board. It really doesn't sit well with your, your donors. It makes it to the outside world like you really can't manage your money. And that's, your reputation can be damaged by that. Well, now that we've found a, a few ways to handle it in the short run, maybe you can help us understand how to prevent it from happening in the future or what we may have 
done wrong, uh, assuming it wasn't some kind of emergency like a like an IT failure or, or, or something. Uh, what can we do in the long term to prevent it from happening again, and, and what might we have done? Well, a, a planning helps, <laughs> and the best way to do that is to set up a budgeting process that's based on really valid assumptions of income. Uh, it's not so difficult to determine what your expenses are going to be, uh, although you somehow have to balance your willingness to spend money with your ability to raise money. Um, the, uh, the, one of the big problems I've seen in boards I've served on is that uh, we'll figure out how much money it's going to take to do what we want to do, and then we'll down look at a budget and we'll say, oh, well, there's, there's, a sh there's, this, there's this $300 or $400,000 amount in here that we really don't have an idea of how we're going to get. Well, we're just we're going to go find that money. And, uh, and surprise, that doesn't really work out very well. So the discipline of a budget is to start with assumptions of income that are really uh, solid. Now, who are some of the, some of the actors in, in the budget process? Well, the staff develops the budget. The finance officer and the, or the executive director or both of them come up with a budget proposal. And that's a rigorous process internally. But they present that to the finance committee. And the committee chews on it and then decides whether they're going to make a recommendation to the board uh, approval of that budget. So it goes through a process. The finance committee has to rely on somebody to give them assurance that the assumptions in the budget of income are, make sense. And that's where a governance committee or a, a development committee can come into play. The purpose of a development committee is to raise money for the organization, but they also are involved in, under, in determining just exactly how that money is to be raised. And so in the budget process, what the development committee does is really look at sources of income. And we're talking about contributions more than anything else. The other items on your budget that show income are such as ticket sale or memberships or that sort of thing are based on historical uh, experiences and be pretty solidly you can be comfortable with it. So it's the contributions that become more complicated. So I think what a lot of organizations have done is set up um, uh, developing a chart, of, if you want to call it that, where you break down your potential income for the next year over, a peer, over several categories. And the first would be the money in the bank category, where you've got a uh, you've got uh, money in a, tempor a temporary reserve fund, uh, which is uh, can only be drawn down uh, when certain events take place. Or you have uh, a foundation that's given you a multi-year grant and you know that they're going to send you a check at the beginning of the year. Uh, or you have a commitment in the form of a pledge from an individual where you are you, you're pretty darn sure you're going to get it. The second category is we have reason to believe this is going to come in. We've had a past history with the donor. We've had indications that if we file an application for a grant, we're going to be favorably received. Uh, those are the kinds of things that you can't say you've got it. You're pretty sure you can get it. The final uh, and more uncertain one is a pie in the sky, maybe, would be the category. These are not, but, but and I'm being facetious because these are either serious candidates for contributions, but they're not you don't know if you're going to get it or not. So they may be new donors you're going to. They could be um, uh, foundations that you've gotten, done some research on, and it looks like they would be interested in your, what your organization does, and that they, uh, you, you know what their cycle of contributions and decision making is, and uh, they're worth a shot at. Now, how can having a, a plan like this sort of matrix or an outline with prioritized, uh, you know, assumed contributions, how can that help us with the real monitoring of the ongoing affair? Well, first of all, your budget will be much more uh, realistic. Uh, and that isn't to say that this isn't an iterative process. I mean, as the year goes on, 
and you may find reasons to adjust your budget because circumstances change. But it's the best, best efforts that you take. That way, over, over, the years, over the year, your financial reports that you're generated by your uh, finance officers can be compared with the budget. So you can see how you're doing. You can see whether you're short or, or okay uh, in every category. And it gives you an early warning system. So the, the biggest dread every board member has is, gee, we won't, maybe we won't be, will we be able to pay our bills? At the end of the year, are we going to be in the black? Um, and nobody wants to be on a board where you're carrying a deficit into the next year. Well, Terry, that brings us to our next scenario, which uh, I believe to be extremely relevant to our audience based on polling numbers from last week's survey, uh, which has to do with our ability to read financial reports. Now, this scenario is I serve on the board because of my interest in fulfilling the mission of this great organization, but I leave to others the nitty-gritty financial matters. I don't have much of a head for numbers. Is this an acceptable attitude. It's, uh, I think it's it's fairly common. I mean, um, can't we just rely on the experts on the board to handle the money and we contribute uh, in other ways? Well, I, I don't have much of a head for numbers. I mean, my background is not in finance or accounting. My undergraduate degree is in biology. You, you learn how to read a financial report and understand the financial reports by my experience. And it helps to have people who can help you understand it. But to be able to say, I don't want to look at this because I don't, I'm not interested in this or it's too difficult is really unacceptable because this, the law of the state of Nebraska compels us as workers to uh, fulfill a duty of care. And the duty of care entails, entails an, a, 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 a judgment that's based on uh, an understanding of the facts. So when we, make, when we make a decision, in other words, we cast a vote, it has to be based on some reasonable basis. And you know, that reasonable basis can be informed by others on the board, other committees, experts that come outside, or the staff members. But ultimately, we have to, as board members, understand the process, understand the numbers, and be comfortable with them. It doesn't mean we have to be accountants. It does mean that we have to have some facility of reading the financial information and understanding it. So when we are asked to cast a vote regarding the finances of the organization, we make an intelligent decision. You know, not everybody being in the board service knows how to read financial reports. And if you couple that with the fact that no one wants to look like they don't understand some fundamental to their role as a board member, then we have a real problem. You know, what, uh, what kind of advice do you have for people who might be in this situation? Uh, they know they have a responsibility, uh, but they're afraid to speak up. Well, there are a lot of things rolling along here in this process. One is, you have you need enough time to read the financial information that you're going to be considering at a meeting. If you go into, the, into a meeting and hand you the financial report and say, we're going to vote on this, you shouldn't vote on it. You should say either I'm going to abstain or I won't do this unless you give me enough time to read it. I've gone into those kind of meetings, and the, the numbers on that page become a giant blur to me. I need time to review it and think about it, uh, and we all do. So timeliness is important. But the other thing is you may read this thing and say, I don't get it. Uh, I don't know what this category means, or why is this number different than what I thought it should be. Uh, your duty as a board member is to find out why. Answer those questions. And you can raise those questions at the board meeting. You can call your financial officer of the, of the organization and ask that question. You can call the chairman of the finance committee and ask, you know, I don't understand this. Um, asking questions sometimes seems intimidating. Um, you know, I, in my own experience, I, first time I went to a meeting in New York uh, on a big financial matter, there were Wall Street lawyers and investment bankers. The room was filled with these people. Well, I, was the, I was there representing an organization in Omaha, and 
they were talking to the jargon that investment bankers like to use, and I couldn't follow them. So I felt I had to understand this, or I couldn't do my job. So I raised my hand and said, could you explain that to me? I didn't quite get that. And they rolled their eyes. And you know, they, I could see them thinking, this is the greatest fear. Yeah, this is some bumpkin from Nebraska, you know, asking a stupid question. So they'd answer it, you know, very patronizingly, and I'd get the information I needed. Though I began to understand what what, what was being discussed. And at the, it's a funny thing. At the end of that meeting, and many other meetings where the same scenario took place, one or two people would come up to me and say, "I'm sure glad you asked that question." Mm -hmm. They were afraid to ask it themselves. Well, it is the dynamics of a meeting, particularly a board meeting, can be very intimidating. But you have a duty, and you have the right to ask questions, and you should ask them to make sure you understand it. Now, your organization can help you. All boards should be given the, 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 the background or support to, be, to understand financial reports. What, what are some of the things that uh, EGs or board chairs or finance committees can do to help make sure that all board members uh, can read financial reports and understand what's happening at the organization? Well, you can carve out a, a small period of time in a board meeting and have, have someone explain it. Uh, your, your accountant, the financial officer of the organization, uh, the, the person on the board who has accounting expertise, uh, or bring somebody in from academia who can explain this in a simple, understandable manner, the whole purpose being not to make you an accountant, but be able to read and understand the, re the, the documents and why we're looking at them. Uh, that's a really great service that could be done for board members. Well, you know, in this scenario, we talked quite a bit about the necessity of individual board members playing a role in the monitoring so that they can make good decisions and also fulfill their uh, fiduciary duties. Uh, I want to move on to our scenario to... I might just want to add one thing, oh. but okay. there's a real good practical reason for taking, paying attention to the documents that you receive on a board, whether it's reading reports or uh, reading financial documents um, and trying to understand them. Uh, one of the benefits of being diligent, understanding, what, understanding what's going on, asking the questions, and casting an intelligent vote, is that it provides a legal defense against someone who files a lawsuit claiming this board, you're, you acted irresponsibly or negligently in conducting some of the business at the board. If you have a record that shows you indeed asked the questions, or if you uh, there was a discussion at the board meeting about these subjects, and there was a give and take about them. That's a defense uh, against that kind of lawsuit. So you're protecting yourself, as well as providing a lot better, uh, a lot more input into the overall actions of your board. Excellent. Well, uh, I'd like to move to our next scenario, if we could, uh, to discuss. Uh, something else that might prevent each of us from fulfilling our duties. I know from the polling that many of you out there listening have experienced this next one. Scenario three, my executive committee does all the work and I just get to say yes. Now, what's going on here, Terry? Isn't that a good thing, having other people just uh, they're passionate, they, uh, they want to make all the decisions, and, and you get to just be on the board? Well, you aren't fulfilling your duties uh, as board member because it requires you to be under to understand what's going on. And if you have executive committees that do all the work, you're not participating in the discussion. You're not really participating in the decision making, and you don't really understand what's going on. So you can't you can't prove what they've done without having a better sense of it all. And uh, it disenfranchises the non-executive board members, you, you don't really have a role to play. And those of us who go on nonprofit boards, we do so because we really care about the organization and we want to lend our talents, our, our interests, our experience, our thought processes, uh, maybe even our strategic thinking abilities to 
the board's uh, actions and, 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 and enhance the ability of the organization to fulfill its mission. If you feel that if you find that that's not happening, you're, you're just sitting there in a passive way, it's very disillusioning. And uh, you'll lose the passion and enthusiasm of that particular board or those other board members. They won't be as strong as an advocate for your organization. You'll have the opportunity to get their strategic thinking and their, really cap their capabilities brought to bear on the problems of the organization. In your experience, how does this dynamic come into being? How do we get to... Uh, well, there's often an evolution toward it. I mean, it's... Uh, particularly if you have... There's a, it's kind of a compulsion to increase the size of boards because we think if we have more people on the board, the more money we'll be able to raise in the way of contribution. Uh, and then there's a feeling, well, this is such an unworkable group of people because there's so many. Well, let's just have one group be the, the executive committee kind of handle the really important stuff. And uh, over time, they accumulate all the power. They make all the decisions, and the rest of us are just bystanders. Yeah, I hold this back to the question: What is the role of the executive committee? Oh well, that's an interesting. There's a lot of debate about the value of an executive committee at all. I mean, there are people who say we should just simply get rid of the executive committee. Um, the purpose really is that between board meetings, when it's going, when a matter comes up that requires board action, but it's impractical to try to assemble the full board to deal with the issue because of time constraints, uh, that's when the executive committee can function on behalf of the board. And that has, there's some, and there are situations where that needs, where that happens. And ultimately, after it's over with, you go, the executive committee takes its actions to the full board and says, this is what we did. And we'd like you to ratify this. And so the full board has a chance to look at it and say, yes, we agree with it. Or they could say, no, you think you made a terrible mistake, in which case the executive committee will be more careful the next time. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a limited role. And, uh, but, but it's become a crutch that some boards have, and many boards, utilized. The movement, however, is now away from that. There have been large boards in Omaha who uh, have found that that system really dis didn't function very well, that the non-executive committee board members really hated what was going on. They lost interest. They didn't feel, they felt like they were being used. In fact, some people thought they were unable to fulfill their fiduciary duties because they were so closed out of the real discussions. One organization I belonged to where I was not on the executive committee, when we, when we had the board meetings, as the general board showed up for meetings, the executive committee members who had been meeting earlier were leaving. They didn't even bother to come to the board meeting. Wow. And some, somebody came and reported what, what they had done, and we were asked to ratify it. That's around this, sir. Yeah, who wants to serve on a board like that? So. The, the, many of those organizations that had large boards realized it was not working the way they wanted it to. Uh, well, if you find yourself on a board like this, what are some of the solutions that you found? Well, if you're, if you're uh, several, in several situations, uh, well, I was on a board once where I uh, came on the board and realized that this executive committee had, the executive committee had so much power that the rest of the people were just watching the show. So at the first board meeting, I asked, they had brought me to serve on a committee, and I was the head of that committee, so I had to give my report to the board. And so I said, would, I would like to go around the room and ask every board member how they feel about their service on the board. Is it satisfying them? Or do they feel like contributing? And, and uh, it just opened a floodgate of lamentations about how they, these, many of these people felt they were excluded, that they didn't know what was going on that they felt like they had a lot to contribute and they weren't being given an opportunity to do that. And it was an eye-opener to the people that were serving on the executive committee who thought they you know, didn't really understand how the impact it was having on their colleagues. And so changes started to happen as a result of that. They began to rethink the process and, and redefine the role of the executive committee. Uh, 
I know of another organization where the decision was made by the executive committee that the rest of the board felt was questionable, or at least they felt like they should have been involved because it was important enough. And at a board meeting, they rose up and <laughs> said, we don't want to see this happen anymore. We want, we want to uh, be a party to the decision making. We all live in this community. It's not like we can't get together to talk about it. So they may change structural changes. So yes, you can speak up and make these things happen. Uh, you have to be able to express yourself. Well, our, uh, our next scenario is very closely tied to this one. Uh, and it, it asks, what if it isn't the executive committee that runs the show, but uh, you're still passionate, uh, you're on the board of an organization that you care deeply about, but it's dominated by a, a key donor who serves on the board, or uh, the meetings are run or uh, entirely by the founder, executive director. Uh, what's, what's going on here? What, what do you see in the dynamic? And, uh, what's, what's, what can we do about it? Well, it has a lot of the same elements of the executive committee, uh, except that it, it, what, what happens is, uh, even, though the, 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 even though the board meets and the executive committee isn't controlling everything, there is uh, a uh, the full, and full engagement by board members is diminished. And partly because people give deaths to people who are, you know, been on the board a long, long time, uh, have a history historic role of leadership, uh, or because they are very large donors, uh, you, know, you don't want to antagonize people. I mean, they're really important to your organization. So there's a, uh, a willingness to give them uh, much more uh, authority and responsibility, particularly if they speak up first on an issue, that pretty much ends the discussion. And raising new questions or challenging some things that you think need to be thought about uh, is very hard. And this, this can put a board, and, and, and if the executive if director is in charge of everything, including running the board meeting, which can happen, um, it, it's, it's really uh, diminishing the, the role of the board to the point where they don't feel like they have any oversight function at all. They simply are there to rubber stamp what they're being told. And that's not healthy for the organization, long-term health of the organization. Because a lot of organizations where you have an executive director who found he is the, he, may, he or she may be the founder of it, it's their vision, and, and people gather around to support that person. And over time, the evolution of that organization, if it's successful, will transition into one where the executive director has less of a dominant role in the organization in the sense of governance. Now, in the case of the, the dominant you know, board member, the, the big donor, uh, what, do you, what do you recommend? I mean, it, if, if, they've, if they have an unhealthy influence over the, the governance of the organization, but, you, uh, but their, their insights and their generosity are still well respected, what are what are some solutions for that? Well, if the person is uh, approachable, uh, and they've served on the board, usually they've served on the board a long time, or they've, they've been given money for quite a while, and so they may be my age or older. Uh, you can have a conversation with them about maybe moving into an emeritus board status. And uh, the emeritus, person, emeritus board members don't vote. But they can come to meetings, and they can fulfill some of the really needs that those folks have, those, that dominant board member. But they, they're there because they, they want to know how the money is going to be spent. They really care about the organization. They want to be on the inside to know what's happening. Uh, those functions can be fulfilled by having opportunities to come to the board meeting. They can participate in the conversations. They just can't vote. And it frees up the other members of the board to fulfill their function. Even though that person is there, they're going to be the ultimate decision makers, and so they can talk more openly about the organization's needs. I imagine that you, know, you might find that, that that's a relief for some of the, the long-time uh, board sure. members to move into a new position, and maybe that leaves some of the pressure. Yeah, well, many of them have been on the board a long time, and they really don't care about the 
the business and you know that, that part of the board meeting, they just want to make sure their their ideas are still being implemented, their uh, money is being spent wisely. Mm -hmm. Now, the, in the case of the founder ED, you know, I mean, one of the one of the great advantages of having a founder ED is the the real passion, the um, the zeal, the, the relentlessness. Um, so how do you how do you continue to harness the energy um, of the founder ED while also moving to a more healthy um, governance situation? Well, it's a process of, of trying to uh, get the ED buy into the value of having a vibrant, strong board. That uh, I think there's a fear that these people will will run amok. But you know, board members understand their or at least they should, or they, you shouldn't bring them onto the board. We're not, we're not there to run the organization. We're not there to tell the executive director how to conduct day-to-day -day business. We're there for strategic, long-term long thinking, to get our feedback on how, where the organization should be going, uh, to, to oversee things by looking at financial reports, giving comments and observations about how the organization is being run, programs that are being conducted. What what would happen if we were to free the uh, executive director up of man managing all that stuff would be to spend more time d devoted to the, the actual operation of the organization. Okay. Well, uh, these are excellent insights. Uh, I'd like to switch gears a bit and move on to another set of common, common government issues. Um, you're ready? Sure. Okay. Glad to hear. Glad you're still with us. Um, if I start to nod off, you'll let me know. Well, I just want to make sure you're, you're you know, still have the interest in handling all of these, all of these governance issues. So, um, scenario five: people are curious about your organization. After a board meeting, someone comes up to you at a party and says, "What's going on in your organization? I heard there was some drama, or I heard some big decisions were made." Uh, what are we dealing with here, Terry? Well, we're dealing with the question. You know, we're out. Our board members are out in the community, and they're going to be asked questions about the organization. And the real issue is, what do you say? If somebody asks a question like that, I think you can say, well, you know, board meetings are confidential. I really can't talk about that. And confidentiality is a critical part, of the role of every board member. We we need to keep what happens in the board meeting uh, to ourselves. And uh, because they're important uh, internal discussions, and if we air this publicly, it can damage the organization. But uh, the, but we are in the community, and people are going to ask us about our what, what's going on at the the opera, or what's going on at the uh, you know the, the social service agency. How are how you're doing there? And we should be prepared to dis to discuss it in a way that is a, is an advocacy on behalf of your organization. And sometimes, well, all times, the, the executive director should help the board by preparing some talking points. So we can say, well, you know, uh, this last quarter we had ticket sales that were outstanding. Let me tell you about that. Well, you know, that's a, you know, you're putting a positive spin in a, in a tangible discussion, uh, fact before the public that really helps uh, improve the reputation of the organization. I've had organizations where people would say to me, isn't it true that you're going out of business? You know, that you're in such financial shape? And I, would, I was prepared to respond by saying, well, you know, that's not the case, and let me tell you why. And so, you know, I think you need to be prepared to deal with public perceptions that are negative, but also to sell the organization to your, to your potential donors and supporters. So we're not talking about you know bad news or dramatic things that happen to things. We're talking about the good news also, and being clear about um, you know when it's okay to share information and which information and what should remain confidential. Well, I think it's and there's another factor to this too, and that is there's a lot of in any community there's a lot of gossip, and people uh, are you know sometimes you don't like what's happening and you might. Run about, grumble about it to somebody. 
But we have to realize one of the other duties we have as board members, in addition to the duty of care, is the duty of loyalty, which means we have to put the interests of the organization ahead of ourselves. And saying negative things about the organization outside the boardroom, I think it's very detrimental to that duty. And it, and it, uh, it hurts the organization. Uh, and it's bad, too. Because uh, ultimately, the reputation you have in the community is based on what people hear about you, and what they know about you, and they only hear about things through the board to a great extent. So, you know, the reputation of an organization is fundamental to its success. If the board members aren't on board <laughs> with what's being done uh, in, in the organization, it's going to hurt uh, the, the long-term strategy of the group. So what happens if you are in a, on a board where a decision is made that you just don't agree with? Well, I think you have to decide how important it is. You know, we don't always win and get what we want. And when the vote is one way, you didn't feel like that was the right vote, but it wasn't, you know, the end of the world. That's the decision of the organization, and you get behind it. If you can't do that, then you should, you should really give some thought as to whether you should stay on the board at all. Hmm. And if it's a really fundamental difference that you have, why would you want to stay? I mean, it would be, you, you would be a, a naysayer and a negative impact on the board, and you'd also feel lousy yourself about being in that situation. So I think sometimes we have to make decisions about whether it's worth, uh, worth the effort. Uh, what if the questions are, aren't coming from, uh, you know, a colleague of yours at a party, but what if, it, what if it comes from the media? Well, every, all nonprofits, any organization, should have a designated uh, uh, spokesperson. Usually that's the executive director. Uh, and in critical situations, it's, you know, that's who you want to be answering the questions, or the chairperson. And uh, other board members, if they get phone calls, should refer those into the, the caller to the right person and not try to take it on themselves. Well, this scenario deals with the flow of information from inside the organization to the outside world. But I'd like to look at another common scenario where uh, board members are forced to deal with information coming from outside the organization to the inside. Scenario six, complaints or rumors about the executive director. You're a board member and you're having lunch with the head of another organization that's familiar with your nonprofit. And you ask an innocent question like, how do you perceive our organization is doing? Your friend unleashes a torrent of negative statements about your ED. Or maybe you get a phone call from a staffer with complaints about the management. Uh, or even more serious yet, you might get a serious complaint about unscrupulous financial management or sexual harassment by the ED. Uh, now this scenario is at the heart of a lot of issues, uh, but most importantly, I think, how can the board know what's going on inside the organization. So I guess, I guess the first question should be, how do you respond to this uh, in, the, in the immediate, and then uh, how do board members know what's going on in the organization? Well, the first scenario where you're having lost somebody and they know, they know a little bit about the organization and they deal with it more readily often with the staff people than you do, you should listen <laughs> because you don't want to miss an opportunity to find out if there's something going on that you need to know about. Um, I would be hesitant to engage in a too much of a give take conversation. I think I just ask questions and load up your image base if you can. If it's a phone call from a staffer, you have to weigh whether this is just a, you know, a disgruntled employee because they didn't get a pay raise or something happened that they, you know, didn't like a, a decision by the executive director. Uh, board members shouldn't not get involved in those kinds of conversations. They should, you should say, you know, you're going to have to work this out with the executive director. You know, we, we don't, you direct, report directly to her. Uh, we don't, board is not involved in managing your employment. Um, and you should refer them to whatever complaint process they have within the organization. 
uh, and probably is something set up, or you ought to have something set up, where people can raise issues that they think are significant, um, and uh, with someone in the organization who would, would listen to them. And then there's a process of moving that pro problem up up the chain if, if they don't get a satisfactory answer, or they're un, or they're concerned about their job security if they ask the wrong person. But if it's a serious question, like it involves financial malfeasance, or if it's something in the nature of discrimination or sexual harassment, um, then I think you need to be uh, alert to the, the processes you have for dealing with those kinds of things. You usually have procedures set up in the organization. And mo most importantly, that should be ref usually those get referred to someone on the board who is uh, has investigative power, and that's usually the chair of the uh, audit committee. For those for those more serious uh, questions, what can whistleblower protections do, and what can't they do? Well, uh, if you you should have a whistleblower policy. It's required by the Sarbanes-Oxley Act for nonprofits, and it is, it's basically designed to do two things. One is to set up a process or procedure for raising significant questions, and for uh, dis and and for and, and, and it imposes protections against uh, retaliation. So uh, you can uh, follow that procedure and uh, hopefully get uh, the person would get a res an investigation and a response. Uh, some issues are really critical. If there's a sexual harassment claim made to you as a board member, uh, or a claim made to, I've gotten a letter, I'm, as a chair of the board, I've gotten a letter alleging uh, sexual harassment. Uh, it's, I call that the nuclear option. I mean, it's, it is, uh, it raises every conceivable red flag you could have, and my, my first the uh, first uh, step was to call a law firm and retain them to represent us, do the investigation and figure out what was going on and make some recommendations about what we should do as a board in response to it, as an organization as well. In, 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 a, in a sense, uh, obviously the executive director has to be involved in this process, unless it's the executive director who we're talking about, but I, must, I, want, to, I want to make it really clear that in none of the organizations I'm involved in is there any question about the, the reputation, quality, and ethical standards of, of our executive directors? In fact, some of these people are so extraordinary that it's an absolute joy to work on those boards. <laughs> so I don't want any indication that I'm alluding to anybody that I'm associated with. Well, uh, how can the board know what's going on inside the organization uh, so that, you know, on the one hand, um, the board can see some warning signs early on before maybe they lose valuable staff or they run into some kind of uh, larger problem, uh, but also so that uh, the board can provide the kind of support that they need to the executive director so that they can be an effective leader uh, of the organization. Well, um, when, when, you, uh, when you have a situation where you're worried about the management of the, or the, of the organization by the executive director, um, the goal should be to help uh, the executive director uh, become better at their job. And, and that's, not, that, that's pretty, that should be you know, the underlying responsibility of a board to hire and manage a, an executive director. In, in implicit in that is to help them be better, be good at their job. So having a conversation with them about what people might have said is a very uh, fruitful thing. But you need to have all the facts that you can get at your disposal so that you can have a frank discussion. And the goal shouldn't be to intimidate or harass or you know. Uh, blame anybody, but it should, should be able to find a way to improve their skills. And there's several ways to do that. I hope I'm answering your question. Absolutely. Uh, it, the, one of the ways is to, there, there are workshops that, and, and programs that you can attend to improve your uh, management skills. There are also coaches. 
that uh, executive coaches that you can find that will be very helpful in, in helping executive directors become better managers. And let's face it, many people get put in positions of management who have no training for it. They may have been managed, but they've never been on the other side of the table. And you, uh, I mean, I've, I've been there. I mean, I know how hard it is to uh, manage people. So help, help sure, surely is a, a, a great asset that the board can bring to the process. Now, what do you think is uh, an effective way to evaluate the EV's performance? That, well, that's a complicated problem because um, there's really no way to look into the inside of an organization. It's just really hard to know what's happening there. Uh, what you can do on the macro level, uh, and what, what most boards do, is have a personnel committee or an executive committee serving as a personnel committee to review the performance of the executive director. And, and the way this should work <laughs> is that the executive director sets out goals uh, for the coming year. And these should be measurable goals. They shouldn't pie in the sky concepts like we're going to be the best you know, opera company in the Midwest. Uh, it should be something like we're going to improve ticket sales by 10% or something, something like that. Or hire a development director uh, before the year is out and, and, and put a development program in place. Tangible things. Things that can be measured, yes. And so at the end of the year, the, the reviewing committee of the board can sit down with the executive director who will have prepared a sort of a self-analysis of their performance and compare their, their own views of the performance of the executive director with the, uh, with the executive director and, and have a frank discussion. It's a great feedback opportunity for the executive director to receive a, a sense of the, how the board feels about their performance. Uh, everybody wants to know how their bosses uh, think about them, mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is a good way to uh, make that happen. Uh, at the same time, while they're doing that, the executive director presents the plans for the next year, and they, they agree on that, the committee and the executive director. And then these idea plans and the, and the performance review are taken to the full board at a meeting where you probably go into executive session and you discuss the performance of the executive director, you discuss uh, the, the next year's plans, you discuss uh, comparable wages, and you actually approve, you know, you come to an approval of what would be a compensation package for next year. Those steps all fulfill obligations required internal revenue service. Now that's on a pro level. Beyond that, it's really difficult. Somebody, somebody has to pop up and say, "Here's a, I got a problem. I'm an employee. I've got a problem." Or some third party has to come and say, "You know, there's a real problem." Uh, other, other ways of doing it just don't give you the kind of insight. Um, short of having someone come in who's a professional to do an evaluation of the management of the organization. That's expensive, and you may want to do that if you think there's some difficulties or that you want to, you want to really understand what's going on in an organization where you've heard hints that there's a problem. Uh, and they do interviews. They talk to the executive director, the senior staff, um, talk to some board members. They compile a, an evaluation of the management skills of the executive director and, and how the whole organization works in terms of getting along with each other and, and, and working effectively. And that report comes to the executive director and the board and they can sit down and talk about it and make some changes or uh, provide some additional support. Well, our scenarios are getting more and more difficult. Uh, I think, I think this is a, an especially fun board, ED relations, uh, combined with information floating around the community about the organization and the role of the board member therein. Um, so since we're getting progressively harder, I'd like to move into a, uh, an often discussed but rarely conquered scenario for nonprofit boards, and that's board diversity. Scenario is 
When you look around the boardroom table, all the people are white, mostly male and older. Um, what's the problem here, Terry? Well, the problem is you, you make this, if that's the case, you make a decision in a and you don't have the op the advantage of having a, a broader perspective on issues. Um, a lot of a lot of studies have been done of effectiveness of organizations and decision making in a context where you have a broader group of people at the table, and in every case the decision making is better. It's better because people bring a different way of looking at things. They are they are willing to challenge assumptions. Uh, and they make you think is, this is a terrible word, word to use, but they make you think outside the box. Mm -hmm. And it's a good dynamic, it improves the dynamics of, of conversation. Because let's face it, if, if everybody's male, uh, white, and my age or older, they're all going to think the same way. <laughs> and that's not healthy for uh, the long term uh, of an organization. Now, what do we mean by diversity exactly? Well, there's a lot of different, I mean, most people say, oh, well, you have to have a certain number of minority people on the board, or a certain number of, uh, of females and male balance on the board. Well, there are a lot of different other ways of looking at it, too, but those are, those are the, probably the ones that are the most uh, important in, cer in terms of public perception. But you also think about diversity in geographic diversity. You may be an organization that needs, wants to reach out to a wider uh, audience uh, or, or provide services in a wider to a wider extent and it would be helpful to have board members who are from that area. Uh, you may want to reach a new audience if you're an opera company you may think we need I look around this room with the opera people at the audience and they're all older people why, why aren't we getting young people in here so you may have a desire to bring more people on the board who are a little younger who can uh, give you a perspective. Now, what's the perspective you're looking for? Well, if you have people of a minority of background, they can give you insights into their community that you probably don't know about or aren't really aware of. And they can help, help you appreciate and understand the kind of services that you're trying to offer and whether they can be made broader. Uh, and let's face it, if you're going to go out for foundations to raise money, better have a board that reflects a good balance of male, female, and has uh, racial and ethnic diversity on the board. Um, you know, you, diversity can be things like specific things, like we need to have a, we need to have an accountant on our board. Yeah, so, uh, so a diversity of skill. Right. Um, we need to have a, uh, we probably ought to have a lawyer on the board. Uh, at least one. Well, maybe one's enough. <laughs> um, I want somebody that has some marketing skills. If you've got some advertising and marketing issues that you want to uh, look at, you probably can have somebody on the board who's you know how to raise money. <laughs> that would be that would be helpful. Uh, those are uh, so you're looking at you know some fundamental uh, requirements of diversity in order to meet such expectations of the the public of what your board's face looks like, but also you have specific needs that you need to be recruiting for. Now, what uh, how do the traditional roles of board members create? roadblocks to board diversity and, and how do you overcome them? Well, it's, the, the, well, it's one thing to say, as I've been in many board meetings, we need a more diverse board and then you come back to the next meeting and it's the same people. Uh, you, it, it's really hard, to, it's hard for the board itself to find the people that are uh, going to help them reach diverse goals, mm -hmm. the goals of diversity. But that's our starting point. You say, now look, do you know people who might be candidates for the board? Yeah. Here's some of the people who are the kind of criteria that we're looking for. Help us find these people. And the same thing with the staff. Tell us some people you know that you've had contacts with that care about what we do that would be good candidates. Or you might have an advisory board. Uh, are there people on that advisory board that really ought to be brought up to the full board because they fill some of those criteria? 
And you can reach out into the community and ask people who really know who's out there and who might be a really good person for your board. Give us some ideas. So you, but it has to be very proactive. I think what has to happen is you have to board us to make a commitment that in the next year, we're going to bring on X number of people and they're going to fill these, um, fulfill these, uh, these de descriptions. I, I want to say one other thing about, about the candidates for boards. Um, you know, the first criteria isn't whether they're black or Hispanic or female or male. The first criteria is are they the right kind of person for a board? Are they do they care about what you're doing, what your mission is for the organization? Are they passionate about it? Um, are they intelligent people? People that have demonstrated their uh, leadership. Uh, maybe people who have served on other boards or served as volunteers and they demonstrate their commitment. Uh, do they have the financial wherewithal to make a contribution? Or if not, do they know people that might, they might talk to? Yeah, I think that might be a, you know, a, a roadblock in some cases, especially if you're going to get younger people or if you're trying to get uh, people that, with more diverse backgrounds or perspectives. Um, how, do you, how do you overcome the financial contribution aspect? Well, I don't think anybody, I mean, well, I'm a very, I'm very sensitive to the fact that I don't want that, that I don't want a board member to think that they're a token board member that we're bringing them on because they fulfill some sort of magic number that we have to have on the board. They need to have all the other criteria that you want, as I mentioned, for a board member. But one impediment, and when you're having these conversations with people about your, about their interest in the board, is when you get to the part where you tell them the each board member is expected to contribute, that can be a deal killer. And, uh, but there, are, in my mind, there are other ways to approach this. I mean, I don't, usually when I do bylaws and I talk about that, or not bylaws, but other, other areas, maybe a code of ethics, whatever we, wherever we talk about what board contribution should be, I generally don't put a number in. Uh, other organizations do, and just, you know, difference of opinion on this. I, I say that it should be a number that's agreed upon by the chairman and the individual board member. You have a conversation, uh, it's confident. You know, it's not exactly confidential, but it's it's, it's negotiable. Uh, because some people can give more. And you ought to have a conversation mm -hmm. with them about giving more. Other people who can't give because you know maybe they don't have the financial wherewithal to, but they have other things to give to the board that are really important. They can do other things for you, for the board. For example, they probably know people that have the ability to make a contribution. Mm -hmm. They can introduce the organization to them, they can go to the meetings, set up meetings, go to meetings, and, and be there uh, as, because, let's face it, contributions by individuals, corporations, even foundations, sometimes are very personal. So, so being active in the, uh, the development of the organization is in itself its, its own contribution. Exactly. Excellent. Um, Can you give us an example of a, a board that you've served on where you realized uh, or it, it was decided upon that you needed to, to diversify and how did you uh, approach that? Were you successful and what happened? Well, I don't have a lot of them because I'm still working with other boards to try to make it happen. But one of them did a lot of work outside did with low income people and had uh, constituents that were, had problems you know, that low-income people have. They're not necessarily racial, but they, they can be, but they can are mainly uh, uh, people that aren't necessarily on the board. I mean, not for obvious reasons. And so you can't... There aren't a lot of rich social workers there. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's not, yeah, there aren't a lot of them. No. Yeah. Uh, but the point is that uh, you can have insight into the needs and problems of your constituents by recruiting people who deal with them on a daily basis, I mean, outside of your own organization. And that also uh, fulfills the need to have you know, kind of a window into problems and concerns of people that you're really there to help. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I can be, I can have a philosophical concern about low-income people, but I don't know the day-to-day -day issues that they're facing. I don't know what's really a big problem that needs to be addressed. And that's why bringing board members on who meet that criteria by having that experience can make a difference. Now, one organization I was with made the decision that we needed to expand the board for that reason. And we had one particular board member who was adamant about it. And she was on my, I was the chair of the development, or the nominating committee. And she pestered me until I finally got on board with her. And between us, we organized the, uh, a process of compiling names of people who fit the diversity requirements that we were looking for. And it was a long list. Surprised me. Uh, and it was a list of people in not just Omaha, but in Lincoln, so, and any bit out in greater Nebraska. So we, we were expanding our reach of, of, of candidates for the board uh, in a really dramatic way. And these names came from staffers. They came from some people on the advisory board. Board members chimed in. So we had a variety of sources of information. Then we got, we got information about these individuals so we knew what their backgrounds were and some of their experiences. Not a full-blown resume, but enough information to know who they were and what they did in the community. And we then ranked them according to who we wanted to go after first. So we had them in a, a rank. And that's how we did it. We went out to visit with those people. We didn't say, we want you to serve on our board. We said, we'd like to talk to you about this organization and, 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 it's, and how it works and what the board is like and that sort of thing. We didn't make an offer. So in a sense, we were interviewing them. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they were interviewing us. Yeah. And uh, the way we did it is I was the chairman of the committee. One other person came, usually the chairman of the board and the executive director. And we go to lunch. And fortunately, most of the people we talked to had some prior exposure or connection with the organization. They really knew who we were. And it wasn't a hard sell. It was explaining what the board did, how often they met, what the financial commitment was, uh, you know, where the meetings were going to be held, and that sort of thing. And they got to ask questions of us. We talked about governance issues, you know, one of the big sellers, we have, the, we have a very well-organized government system, we have all the policies in place and we talk about them. Um, we were able to fill those seats. Now we didn't totally focus on that. We had other candidates come along, the, you know, throughout these processes who, who didn't fit the diversity skill, except for they were females. But they they had really incredible credentials. And so you, we, weren't, we weren't passing people up in any way, and yet we were able to strengthen the diversity of the board. Okay. Now, uh, we had a question come in uh, via the chat feature, uh, and I invite you all to do so if, if, you, if you feel inclined. Uh, what role do the bylaws or can they play in outlining board diversity for an organization. Do you think that's a good move um, to, to specify or um, to I, Well, um, bylaws generally talk about how boards are set up in terms of explains the directors, how they're elected, uh, different classifications. It talks about officers, how they're elected, and, and, and that sort of thing. Talks about terms of office, length of terms. Uh, talks about uh, committees, meetings. That's pretty mechanical stuff. It's, it's, a, it's the guts of how an organization functions. I wouldn't put it in the bylaws particularly. I think I'd put it in a code of ethics. Okay. Uh, I think it's a. It, you, you should say to the world that we do not discriminate in any way. We seek to have diversity in, in, in all of it. You know, in our, in our staff and in our board without putting a, 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 a quota in place, that's enough, I think. Uh, bylaws are, uh, well, lawyers love bylaws. 
play with them, but they have a specific purpose. Uh, they shouldn't be loaded up with stuff that you really, other the policy questions. Those can be dealt with uh, in a separate, in a separate document, in separate votes and considerations. Okay. That's not to say, I mean, if you want to put them in the bylaws, fine, but you don't want to lock yourself into something that you can't, you can't uh, achieve. Well, Terry, now that we, uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add about Fort Diversity? before we move on to the next scenario? Uh, my experience is that when you, when you, I went on a board recently where I was the only person, was a board in New York State, I'm the only person west of the Hudson River. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized when I came to my Mr. meetings, I had a perspective that was completely different and, than a lot of the people who had been there for a long time. And it wasn't, that's not good or bad, but it was just, I offered a unique perspective on things. And I think that reinforces in my mind the value of having people that don't necessarily think the same way I do. Uh, they challenged me to be more thoughtful. Uh, they forced me to reconsider uh, assumptions that you know I've been dragging along with me for a long time which may not be valid anymore. Thank you. Well, now that we have perfect board composition and are uh, getting out there uh, to affect our mission, let's talk about what happens when we all get together at our board meetings. And don't worry, uh, that's not a typo on your screen. Um, scenario 8, board meetings. Your meetings are boring. The executive director or a select group of the board run the meeting uh, and simply report to the board uh, what is going on, or maybe it's Maybe it's just a series of committee reports. You know, we met at such and such time and we discussed this thing. Um, it's boring, but isn't that what board meetings are supposed to be? Well, it's supposed to be informative. I mean, you should come together to, uh, to uh, as a board to consider the, you know, where the organization is and where it's going. Uh, whether you clutter the meeting up with a lot of reports is a pretty good, pretty good, pretty big question, I think. Many boards that I'm on have moved to consent minutes where all of the committees keep minutes of their meetings and they submit the minutes to, uh, as part of the board packet. And the executive director may want to have a written report. That becomes part of the process too, uh, of the consent minutes. Yeah, could you uh, could you talk a little bit more about consent agendas? How that, how well, I mean, the board agenda, the first item is approving the minutes, <laughs> the last meeting, and then the next item is the consent minutes. And these are itemized and attached. The committee meeting minutes are attached, or the executive director's report is attached, and uh, any other kind of ministerial uh, letter or document can be attached as well. And and what the chairperson says is, these are the consent minutes. Uh, what we'd like to do is approve them. So I need a motion to approve. And if the motion is made and seconded, then there's a discussion. And the discussion is, if anyone has an item, a, a question or a concern about something on the consent agenda in those minutes that they want to bring before the full board, please speak up. and we We'll remove those items from the consent minutes and we'll bring them up to the third part of the meeting where we discuss other business. Now what happens is two things. One is you expect everybody on the board to read the uh, minutes so they understand because it can tell you what's going on in your organization. So you don't have to listen to somebody drone about it. You actually read it. You can understand it. You don't have to listen to somebody talk about it. So you assume people are reading this stuff. But secondly, it speeds up the process immeasurably. Instead of spending 35, 30 minutes on reports, you're done in a matter of seconds. And you can move on to something more important, like obviously you've got to look at the financials and go through those and see how you're doing, and the uh, chairman of the finance committee and the finance officer talk about it. That's pretty important. I mean, you, you got to have that. And then the rest of the meeting can be spent talking about really important stuff. Well, you know, this brings up, uh, this reminds me of something 
thing we talked about a couple of days ago when we were preparing for today, which is that you said meetings should reinforce love for the organization. Tell me what you mean by that. How can you do that? Well, here you have a group of people who are really smart sitting around the table. They're, they're there because they want, us, they want to give their best ideas, thoughts, and consideration to important questions that bear on the organization. Why don't we take full advantage of that? Mm -hmm. There are lots of issues that come up periodically or that are ongoing that we need to... It would be great for the executive director to say, give me your feedback on my thought. My, I think we should head in this direction. What do you think? Or I think we should cut back on this because for the following reasons. Or, you know, there's some trends in our business that I think we need to think about and consider whether that affects us. Um, or some outside impact is going to come on this organization. We need to be prepared for it. Boy, that just gets people's blood up. I mean, that's a wonderful opportunity. To, those, are, those are important discussions and <coughs> people who want to serve on board want to be engaged in those kinds of conversations. And the other, the other important thing is that makes people excited is what does the organization do? Well, it provides a service. Let's have somebody come in and tell us about the service that they're providing. If it's a social services organization and you have people who are staffing it and are dealing with the, the, your constituents on a regular basis, why not ask them to come in and discuss what they do and why they want to do it? What, what makes them get up in the morning and come in and work? What is the passion that drives them? Because that's why we're on the board. We're there to support that kind of work. And the more we can be pumped up by knowing who those people are and that they're doing the job we want them to do, the more satisfying we, ha we are as a board member. What have you seen in the past that helps make that happen? What, what, can, you, what can you include in the, the agenda that allows for that? I think the executive director and the chairman need to think about well, what are the pertinent issues that we could bring to the board for, for discussion so they can plan the agenda in advance and make sure that they have given to the board in advance enough information to have them be able to intelligently discuss the question. Uh, I think on the other hand, you can bring people in. For example, one organization I was with had a large number of interns in the summer. They bring the interns to the meeting, and each one of the interns talks about why they're there and why it's important to them. Why what this group organization does really is meaningful to them, and that in their education, they're planning to be involved in those kinds of issues. It's a very gratifying thing to see that there's a whole new generation of people coming along who are interested in helping, for example, low-income people. You know, that, that's inspirational to me. And I think other people would feel the same way. And one other concept that I hadn't really thought about that I went to a meeting of a bunch of opera people who were on boards and their whole purpose of the meeting is talking about governance issues, and so I always come away with some really interesting concepts. But one of them was, why not put at the end of the meeting an opportunity for the executive director to speak directly to the organization, to the board? <coughs> and basic, one, of the, one of the things that you sh we should be thinking about and the executive director should be thinking about is you want to leave that board meeting as directors where you can't wait to come back for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? What can the executive director do to foster that kind of enthusiasm? He or she can talk about the achievements that are, that, that are going on in the, in the group, what, what they've been doing. Put a positive, some positive information out there. Quite often, many times, directors talk about all the problems that they're trying to face. What about the successes? What about stoking the fires of enthusiasm in the board so that when we go out of the board feeling really good about the or what the group is, the organization is doing and feel good about our involvement with them. Well, uh, do you have anything else you'd like to discuss about board meetings before we move on? Oh, uh, the shorter the better. <laughs> the shorter the better. As infrequent as possible. <laughs> Many, I've, I've heard of boards that meet monthly, and I think, these people are nuts. 
you shouldn't if if you if you uh, set up a very vibrant committee system where the business of the of the board is done at the committee level, um, you shouldn't have to have board meetings more than four times a year unless there's a real big emergency or you need to have a strategic session meeting for planning purposes. Uh, I'd cut down on board meeting numbers uh, frequency. What? Uh you serve on, you've served on many boards. What have you found? What's been a, a good frequency in your mind? Uh, four. four. Four, yeah. So quarterly with, uh, with committee meetings in between. Yes, and the committee meetings don't have to be face-to-face. -face. Uh, they can be by, by telephone because much of the information you're going to get in writing beforehand uh, there's usually a staff person associated with that committee who can help with the, with the conversation and get the information out to people. Uh, quite a bit of the business can be done on the phone. So you know, the phys physical meeting, getting everybody together in one place can sometimes be a, a burden, particularly if it's a statewide organization. So the phone service, it can be used well. I have found telephonic participation in board meetings problematic. Uh, the, 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 the sound systems don't always work. People can't hear each other effectively. And it's daunting if you're on the end of the of phone line to speak up. Yeah, and it's also hard to know just how engaged people are when you're not in the room with them. You can't see them. Yeah, I get a lot of work done. When I <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we've covered eight scenarios. And this is, this is the last of our scenarios. but. I want to take an opportunity, since we have Terry with us, to talk about uh, some other things um, that he thinks are important that we all recognize and that um, organizations must have in place in order to be successful and to uh, fulfill all of their duties. And we'll just uh, take a, oh, let's see, one second. Okay. Yep. Um, so, let me if you could talk to us briefly, Terry, about uh, some of these policies. What what roles they serve and the, the level of, of importance you place on them. Well, someone called in earlier or typed in earlier that they uh, wanted to want to know what the extent of the bylaw should be regarding diversity, and that there is the you, you need to have a set of bylaws and. Bylaws need to be drafted by, it really is helpful to have a lawyer draft the bylaws because there are some mechanical requirements and legal requirements that need to be in there. Uh, and lawyers are good at paper you know, document drafting and that sort of thing and they kind of love that sort of stuff, or at least I do. Uh, bylaws shouldn't be, they're not cast, carved in stone, they're uh, flexible. So every year, uh, probably the governance committee, if you have such a thing, should look at the bylaws and make recommendations whether they need to be updated, modified, or changed. For example, you may want to expand the number of board members. And you probably already have in your bylaws the range that you have for members, and you may have bumped up against the top. It may not be a good idea to expand the number of board members, but if you want to do that, you have to amend the bylaws. Uh, so bylaws are critical. I mean, everybody on this call has bylaws. But the question is, have they been reviewed recently and uh, can they be uh, updated? Well, and I guess another question is, are bylaws just a formality or is it something that, you know, organizations should be actively engaged with? And as you said, you know, how you said they should be reviewed regularly. What, so it isn't just something that you put in place and then, and then pull out of the, the closet five years later. No, it's a living it's a document and you refer to it a lot. Mm -hmm. Not everybody likes to refer to the bylaws, but you'll have a lawyer on your board and that person can look at the bylaws and make sure that what you're doing is right. Are you giving the notice for something at a proper time, giving people enough time to do it? Uh, when are people, you know, how do we, elections of officers and things like that, when they're held, might be variable when you want to change it. Uh, but it's, uh, and the reason we have bylaws, for, uh, and the fact that that's all corporations have to have bylaws, is the Internal Revenue Service, when you file for your 501c3 uh, status, makes you file a set of bylaws. 
So you're starting out with bylaws, and they have to be, you have to, you have to pay attention to them. And can you tell us about, tell us about the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the implications for the nonprofit sector? There's a few, and a few items I know that we have to have in place because of it. Uh, right. The, um, I mentioned Enron and WorldCom and, and the problem that the United Way had with way overpaying their executives. Uh, those are scandals that uh, got the attention of not only the United States Senate uh, Committee that was then led by Senator Grassley in Iowa, but uh, the Senate was so outraged they passed the Sarbanes-Oxley bill, which had a lot of requirements for governance for corporations. It was primarily aimed at uh, for-profit companies, but they had several provisions in there that affect nonprofits, <clears throat> and those are a whistleblower policy, a document retention and destruction policy, and a conflict of interest policy. Uh, and they actually, the Internal Revenue Service actually provided you an example of the format for a conflict of interest policy. So you you don't have to uh, go too far to find out how to do that and what they want to have in place. And they ask you in their 990, which we all have to file annually, it's our tax return to the Internal Revenue Service, uh, do we have a whistleblower policy? Do you have a uh, document retention policy? Do you have a conflicts of interest policy? And uh, the question is, you know, uh, you know what's the, what does that look like and what should be in it? And it would probably be helpful to have uh, Occasionally, look at it and make sure it makes sense. Now, you know, similar to the bylaws, are these just things to quote unquote have in place and then feel good, or are these also, uh, you know, living documents, things that need to be referred to, things that need to be at least uh, considered in the ongoing operation of the organization? Now, these are these are really management tools. You have to have them in place and you have to use them. And they provide protection to employees or volunteers or board members who feel like they want to raise an issue and don't want to be retaliated against. They provide uh, a roadmap for how you bring these issues to uh, a detention of the right person if you have a complaint. Uh, that's for the document retention policy, I mean the whistleblower policy. The document retention policy probably has a schedule attached of all the different kinds of documents you've got and what to do with them. Uh, after a period of time. And some you don't want to get, ever get rid of because the law says you better maintain them in perpetuity. Some of them have a per number of years that you can have them and then you can get rid of them. So it's a way to clear out all the paperwork or the stuff that's on the, your, your computers uh, at a point in time where you I don't want to keep this stuff anymore. I don't need to keep it. Mm -hmm. But it also has built into it a procedure for holding things if there's an investigation pending or going on, or a lawsuit that's pending or going on, so you don't destroy property and that you can get into really big trouble if you, if you destroy them. And that happened to a very large accounting firm which went out of business as a result of uh, their, uh, their destroying uh, evidence. So these policies are put in place, they're managed in, in great part internally, uh, not necessarily by the board, but they're excellent guidelines and if you deviate from them, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. So it's good to have uh, an awareness of them and uh, that they be uh, followed. And I'd like to talk about um, one of the things you have listed under its practices, which is the code of ethics. Can we spend a little time talking about the code of ethics? What is that and, and why is it important? Why do you think it's important to have a code of ethics in place? Well, I think this fits in tandem with the conflicts of interest policy. Uh, the conflicts of interest policy just says uh, I'm not going to engage in any activity where I get my self-interest is put ahead of the organization. So you're fulfilling all of those duties. Yeah, and I'll disclose, I'll disclose that. Mm -hmm. And then the board can make a decision about whether or not that's a real conflict or not, or whether there's, you know, uh, we can go ahead with, even though there is a conflict, because it's the best deal we can get. So it often deals with contracts uh, or service agreements. Uh, Beyond that, there are other things that you really want the public and your own people to acknowledge, and that's what a code of ethics is about. So you can, you can describe 
how you're going to deal with people. You're going to deal with everybody fairly. You're going to be transparent in your financial information. You're going to be thorough and complete in your financial reporting and reporting to the government. You're going to obey the law. Uh, you're going to fulfill the duties of care and duties of um, loyalty to the organization. You're going to hold things in confidence. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you're going to participate in the financial support, you know, financial support of the organization by at least working with the development group to make sure it happens. You're going to attend meetings. Uh, you're going to participate actively in meetings. So those are the kinds of things that are in a, a, uh, that report. And it also talks about processes and procedures for uh, raising issues and complaints and, and how uh, those can, and, and refers to the whistleblower policy. Uh, almost every public, all public corporations have these things. Most nonprofits have a code of ethics. Uh, it is uh, best practices say we need to have this. Some, you won't find this in any statutes, but it's a good idea. And I think if you look through a, a form of code of ethics that organizations use, you'll find out that they are really very practical. Uh, uh, expositions of what the board's view of its responsibilities are. Can you give us an example of a time when uh, the code of ethics came into play? Have you maybe referred to your code of ethics or it, it drove uh, your decision making on a particular matter? Uh, one time years ago I was uh, involved in a public traded that was buying a company in another state. And in conversations, because of the general counsel, I was worried about all the legal aspects of it. In conversations, I realized that the person who was going to take over management of that company, the bar side, and the person who was driving the deal, to speak, had not taken in any consideration what to do with the employees that were there. Basically, they were going to leave them hanging uh, until they got around to fixing that problem. Uncertain about their futures. Yeah. And I said, well, that's right. I mean, we, don't you have in place a procedure for dealing with this so they can be told? I mean, there are, you know, you want this organization to continue to work effectively after the, trans after the transaction. What kind of morale are you going to face? And I said, that's not your problem. You know, you don't need to worry about that. We don't, we don't really care about those people. Um, that didn't sit well with me, so I went down the hall to the, you know, the executive uh, chief, chief, op, chief executive officer of the corporation. And I said, I want you to know what's going on here because, and I told him, and I said, you know, this is not the way we say we're going to conduct business in our code of ethics. These people need to know. It's fair treatment to tell them. You're not going to keep your job, but here's what we're going to do for you in the way of letting you go or you are going to have your job and so you can count on that. And he said, right. So he went down the hall and told those people to fix that and they did. Mm -hmm. And the result was a very smooth transition where people on the day of the closing, you know, the guy who was going to take over the business that didn't care about these people, had to get up in front of them and say, here's the plan and everybody was given the information they needed about their future. And I thought, now that's living your ethics in your in actual practice. I had another case where we were sitting around a room uh, talking about a partner that was irritating us, and there were there were three partners in a deal, and one of the partners was kind of a problem, and the other partner wanted to get rid of them and uh, just get them out of the picture. And this organization, public. It was, a, it was a private company, had a history of partnering with people, and so they had a tradition of relationships with partners, which was based on trust and mutual support. And they just didn't screw apart. That was the basic. So this conversation, yeah, well, this conversation was going down the wrong road, and I said, and then there was a very senior person in the room who was kind of thinking, well, you know, maybe, I don't know. And I said, wait a minute. We, and it does take some books for to do this. I mean, I, I'd been around long enough where I felt like I could say this. We don't, we can't do that. 
uh, it's not the way we conduct ourselves, conduct our business. You know, we will always treat our partners fair and square. If we can't work it out with them, you know, we figure out some other solution. But we don't, we don't, we don't behave the way we've been talking about. And of course, the senior person said, "That's right, we won't." Mm -hmm. But if the, if I hadn't spoke up, I'm not sure where the <laughs> where this would have ended up. So I think it's it's understanding the the fundamental uh, ethical grounding of your organization that can be set forth in your code of ethics. And then that's your touchstone. You go back to that and say, what are our first principles? And I really learned this at another meeting I was at long ago at, at the Aspen Institute where they were talking about corporate ethics, which sometimes sounds like an oxymoron, but I don't think it is. I think it's really true. Uh, Johnson & Johnson had, a, had made, a, made, made Tylenol back in the, in, the, in the day, and someone had figured out it adulterated by taking the lid off and, and putting some poison in, and people were killed. As a result, it was a huge problem and a gigantic problem for Johnson & Johnson because this is one of the biggest products on the market. The board met with their executives and the first thing they did was went back to their code of ethics. What should we do in this situation? What's the most important thing we can do? And in the face of losing their largest financial source of, source of income, they stopped, they took every town of bottle off the shelves and stopped making it. And they reconfigured the, the, the bottles to make them tamper proof. And of course the public was, you know, you know uh, the, 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 the uh, people who write about this kind of stuff said, oh that was a terrible mistake, they're going to lose market share. And, and of course they did lose market share until they came back on the market with their new bottles. They regained all of the market they had ever lost. What's the lesson? They stick to big, big questions, big issues like that, big catastrophes or big challenges. Look to your fundamental mission and your reason for existence and your, what you say to the world is what guides you ethically. Ethical behavior ensures sustainability and success in the world. That's, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, although there's recently been a story about Johnson & Johnson where they clearly didn't do that. So it's, uh, you have to be consistent. <laughs> uh, well, excellent. Well, um, I'm wondering if anybody out there has any questions you'd like to send through the chat feature. Um, and if not, I'd like to uh, turn it back to Terry for some closing remarks. So do you have any questions? You'll let me know, right? I will let you know. Okay. okay. Well, I, I think we all, all of us who are board members, we serve on nonprofit boards because we really have a passion for the mission of the organization. And we want to, we want to provide guidance uh, based on our experience, uh, our expertise, our intelligence, our strategic uh, thinking capabilities to, uh, in, our, in our oversight function, and in our, uh, as, as board members, and our fiduciary duties on the board. Uh, I believe that good governance practices can help us fulfill our board responsibilities in a way that will make it a satisfying and gratifying experience and a positive contribution to the mission of the, of the organization. And I believe this because I've seen that happen. But you know, uh, words are not enough, uh, and good intentions are not sufficient. To make good governance work, we have to, we have to shove. <laughs> uh, we have to pay attention. We have to read the materials. Uh, we have to actively participate in board and committee meetings. We have to have a structure in place that gives us the ability to do all those things more efficiently. Uh, so I don't think it's easy to put good governance pra in practice. Uh, and it's definitely an evolving concept where we have to keep looking to see that the policies and procedures we put in place continue to make sense. So Todd, I'd like to thank you and uh, the Nonprofit Association of the Midlands for giving me this opportunity to lead this uh, webinar. And to thank the people who uh, called in and were patient enough to listen to all this. Uh, 
for their contributions uh, to their nonprofit organizations. And I guess we've all got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. Well, I want to thank you for all the time you've spent with us today and with me in the past few weeks preparing for today's presentation. Your insights into the world of nonprofit governance are invaluable. And today has certainly shed light on some very difficult situations and, and brought us back to, uh, to remind us of why we engage in board service um, and what it means to be an effective board member. So, um, and I want to thank all of you for your uh, participation today and encourage you to join us next month uh, for our public policy and advocacy series with Becky Gould, Executive Director of Nebraska Appleseed, March 27, 2014. The uh, title of her presentation is Can We Advocate? Yes, we can. She's going to walk us through um, public policy and advocacy issues for nonprofit organizations, shed light on uh, uh, lobbying requirements and the difference between general advocacy and, and uh, advocating for our missions and actually engaging in formal lobbying processes. So we hope to see you all next month and I'll be sending out a link to everyone uh, if you would like to view this recording on our YouTube channel. So uh, with that, uh, uh, I thank all of you and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Please stand by.